Good evening and welcome to our midweek service tonight and uh, uh, glad to see you all, glad you all tuned in. Uh, tonight I want to talk about three or four different things. First of all I want to give this little notice, I'm going to put this notice out oh, probably a month or a month and a half ahead. Uh, in the future I'm going to be doing a study on Revelation and I want to go through the entire book and I've been reading Revelation for the last year, I've been studying different commentaries, getting all kinds of different ideas so I think it's going to be a good study. Not that I'm an expert on it, by in no means am I an expert, and I don't have everything figured out, but uh, we're going to go through it, and hopefully that we'll all have a better understanding of it by the time we get through. So you be thinking about that. It, it might, it'll be at least a month, I'm sure, but uh, that's coming up in the future. And also tonight, I've got on my shirt, my Kansas City shirt. You see this, I'm sure you did. There's two things on the shirt. There's Kansas City, and there's I Voted. You know, I was thinking about that, and that stands, you know, I, that stands for something. And I would like to say, think that I, I do stand for something. And, and if we don't all uh, stand for something, there's a saying that if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. And so when, when you see the little KC there, if any of you know anything about sports, Kansas City Royals, they're not doing real good this year. They're doing better now than they did the first half. But that's not the point. You see, I, I uh, became a Kansas City Royal fan back in 1969. And I've been there ever since, and I'm faithful. And that's what, when I wear this shirt, Casey, no matter how they're doing good, doing their bad, it means that I'm faithful to them. And that's, you know, that's a good trait about anybody. If you can be faithful, faithful to your to your family, to your, your husband, your wife, faithful to your job, faithful to your church attendance, faithful to serving God, faithful to reading your Bible, faithful to praying, uh, that'll take you a long ways in life. Because a person that just jumps around, hopscotch here and hopscotch there, you're not going to, uh, make it very far without running into a lot of difficulties. So that's what the KC stands for tonight, being faithful. And the I voted. And I, I, that, what that stands for is that I'm, I'm an American. Proud to be an American. Thank God that we have the opportunity to live in America. And uh, I feel sorry for all of the people that don't like America and are coming against America. It's a sad thing. If, that, if America is such a bad place to live, I wonder why we have millions of people trying to cross the border to get in to live in this terrible land. Well, I think it's still a pretty good place to live. And uh, for it to continue to be the good place that it needs to be, we need to elect the right uh, people in the right offices. And uh, as a Christian, I can only vote one way. I had a man ask me last night about a certain candidate, and he said, lay aside that she carries a Bible, that she's a Christian, she goes to church and all that stuff, and then what do you think about her on the side of that? And I said, well, first of all, I can't lay that aside because that's who I am. And I have to base my voting on Christian principles. And somebody that's uh, living a Christian life versus somebody that uh, denies God, that Christian's going to get my vote. And the things they stand for, you know, against, uh, you know, might as well spit it out, against abortion. And I'm not saying that there's not some cases, extreme cases, where abortion might be necessary. I'm not, I'm not even going to go there. I, you'd have to take each individual case in itself, and uh, and not every one of those that you might think even deserves an abortion. Because uh, I heard a story this afternoon on the radio that a young 13-year-old got, girl got raped, and and uh, she uh, decided to have a child, and so she went through with it. And now she's a proud mother of a very beautiful little boy. Why should we punish? The, now they arrested the guy that raped her. He had raped several other women, and so we shouldn't punish the the victims, but punish the, the criminals. And so, as well as that, uh, homosexual uh, agenda. Yes, I'm against it. You better believe I'm against it. The Bible says that uh, it's according to the Word of God, it's an abomination, it's a sin. So I'm against sin. I'm against the rapist. I'm against the homosexual. Uh, not against the homosexual as a person. Uh, against what they're involved in, the thing that's, that's literally destroying their life. Now, my compassion goes out to homosexuals and to people of all sin natures uh, that they might find a relationship with Jesus Christ. Transgender, God made us male and female. Male and female made he them is what uh, the Bible says there in Genesis. Didn't give a third option. You're either a man or you're a woman. That's the end of the story. And the uh, society we live in is trying to change all of that. So that's why it's so very important that we vote and stand up for God-given principles and uh, uh, just stick to that. You know, if the church doesn't stand up for what's right, uh, the world certainly isn't going to. We see that in the news every day, uh, how that it looks like if you're a Bible-believing person that thinks these things are wrong, they look at you as you're some kind of a kind of a dummy. Well, that was just my little introduction to what I believe and what my KC stands for and what my I voted stands for. 
But tonight I want to talk about something following through. Uh, following through is a very, very important thing. If you don't follow through on things in your life, you'll never get anywhere. You'll only get halfway or a quarter of the way or barely get started. And Paul uh, deals with this in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. He said, I am confident of this very thing, that he which began a good work in me will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now that's the King James Version. Now, I understand what it says, but let's simplify it a little bit, put it in the New Living Translation. He said, I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Jesus Christ returns. When Christ saves you, he wants to keep you in good relation with him until he comes back to take you out of this world, take you to a place called heaven. And uh, so Paul was convinced that when he started his relationship with Christ, that, uh, that, that Christ was going to help him. And Christ will help you. And Christ will help you. All we're going to do is learn to call on him, learn to communicate to him, learn to, learn to do what God wants us to do. And that's, that's be, uh, what he calls us to be. Be a Christian. Be a Christian. Live a Christian life. And uh, what, what does that consist of? Well, being a Christian life, first of all, you've got to commit your life to Christ. Once you've committed your life to Christ, you want to build that life. You're a babe in Christ, and you need to grow, and you need to mature. So therefore, you probably probably should read the book. You should probably read the Bible and find out uh, some things about God. And as you begin to grow in the Lord, you'll find out that Word, the, the Bible, the Word of God, becomes like nourishment to your soul, and it makes you stronger in your faith with Jesus Christ, and it helps you through the difficult times. We should pray. Uh, your, your prayer is just simply nothing more than a conversation with God. Your thoughts going up to God's thoughts and God's thoughts coming down to your uh, way of life. Now, prayer is a, a lot of people think it's a one-way avenue, but it's not really. It's a two-way avenue. Uh, we pray to God, and we also not just tell God what we need and lay it all out for God, and God sits there and listens to us, and then he nods his head, okay, and walks away. That's not it. As we talk to God, we pray to him, God will also communicate back with you. And you may not hear audible words from him, but you'll feel the direction of God in your life if you sincerely get down and begin to pray. So if you're a Christian, get started in this journey that Paul's talking about here. He who began the good work in you will perform it until the day that Jesus Christ comes back to take us out of this world. So grow and mature in the Lord the very best you can. Make yourself as strong with Christ as you can uh, so you'll be enable, able to endure the, the difficult things that you face in this world. Uh, my goodness, there is a, uh, the, the devil is on a rampage today, and he's trying to destroy uh, Christianity, trying to destroy the church, trying to destroy the family, trying to destroy America, uh, because America was based and built on pr Christian principles, and he's trying to tear that down as much as he possibly can. So you and I should stand strong in our faith for Jesus Christ, lifting his name up. Now, there's a story in the Bible about uh, Nehemiah, and Nehemiah built a wall. And I'm not going to read all the scripture. There's the first six chapters of Nehemiah. It talks about Nehemiah was the king's cupbearer. He was in captivity. He, he was uh, taken captive out of Jerusalem. He was brought to, uh, to the king, and he became the cupbearer. Now, the cupbearer was a very close-to-the-king job, but it wasn't really all that great a job because back in those days, they liked to poison kings. They would put... Uh, poison in their wine or in their food and everything. So the cupbearer was a man that when they poured it in, he tasted of it first. If the cupbearer didn't fall over dead, then the king would knew it was all right to go ahead and eat it. So you see, it could be a very, a very, very dangerous uh, job. Amen. Uh, just let me back up a little. Paul was the type of guy that liked to follow through. And uh, there's a story that you all heard of, of the tortoise and the hare, how they get up to the finish starting line and and the, the tortoise or the rabbit uh, takes off with lightning speed, and the and the old turtle, 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 tortoise, turtle, tortoise, hare, rabbit. Uh, you get the idea now. After all my tongue-tied business, sir, uh, that that rabbit will run out, jump out, and man, he'll be halfway down the road before that turtle ever gets five inches from the starting line. And we just know automatically that. Uh, that tortoise, that uh, that uh, rabbit is going to win the race. Well, the story way the story goes with the rabbit. He he goes down there and he sees that he's so far ahead of that turtle that that uh, he uh, just decides to call up under a shade tree and take a nap. And so he does. He's laying there with his hands behind his head, his legs crossed, just just resting to to beat the band. 
And this turtle is just one foot in front of another, just one foot in front of another. He just keeps coming along, keeps coming along, until he eventually passes that that uh, rabbit. And the long story short of this matter is, the one that keeps prodding ahead is the one that's going to win the battle. You can't just run like crazy for a while and stop and take a break. In your Christian life, there, you shouldn't be taking breaks and being a Christian. And that's what that's all about. Paul made up his mind that he was going to keep keep his nose to the grindstone as a Christian and that he was going to finish the race no matter what the obstacles in life were. And that's what we all need to deal with. We're going to finish this race of being a Christian because there will be obstacles. As a pastor, it seems like the past few days I've run into a lot of people that have got a lot of obstacles. Uh, but we've got to keep on keeping on knowing that God, the Bible says, who is the author and the finisher of our faith, which means he started us, he's going to finish us, will help us to get to that uh, in line. So now back to Nehemiah. Nehemiah was the king's cupbearer, and uh, he got uh, some of his brethren came from Jerusalem, and so he asked them a question. He said, uh, how is it back in Jerusalem? What's everything look like here? And he said, it's terrible. He said, the city lay in ruins, the gates are torn off the hinges, the walls are torn down, and it's absolutely a disgrace to humanity. It's a disgrace to God's people. Well, that really burdened Nehemiah's heart because he, he was a very faithful Christian, very faithful servant of God, I should say. And uh, so this really, I mean, he always had a smile on his face till he got this news. And he went before the king the next day, and the king said, Nehemiah, what's wrong? He said, you, you never come in here with a sad look on your face, but today there's something bothering you. And he said, well, king, he said, i, I got to tell you, he said, my, my native land, it, it lies in destruction, and uh, it's really, really bothering me. And I wish I could do something about it. I'd like to go back and to, to rebuild the walls and to, and to hang the gates on their hinges and, and get the city started back in the right direction. Uh, I want to stop right there and say that. I like what I just said. didn't know what I was going to say it. But, you know, when we look at any bad situation, we have to start, and maybe we won't finish it all in a day, but if we can get the thing started back in the right direction. Now, you may be listening to me tonight, and you just know that you're a long ways from where you should be. But if you'll start and get things headed in the right direction, I believe God will give you the strength to complete it, and you will eventually get to where you need to be. So the king looked at Nehemiah and said, Nehemiah said, uh, what, what does you need? And Nehemiah said, well, would you give me some time off uh, to go back and to see what I can do to help the city of Jerusalem? And the king said, yeah, I will. How much time do you need? And he told him how much time he needed, and he asked that if he would... They kind of send out word that he was coming through the different countries and, and everything like that. So we start out with Nehemiah heard about a problem. And you and I as God's children, when we hear about a problem, we should make up our mind we're going to do, do something about that problem. So Nehemiah got a vision not of walls that were torn down and not the gates were off the hinges, but he began to picture in his mind those walls being rebuilt and those gates hung back on those hinges and the gates shut up and the city began to start back to becoming the city that it used to be. And isn't that the way we should look at people out there in the world today their life is literally in distress and, and in trouble? To look at them as, you know, I, I, I can see them beyond where they are now. I can see them getting it back together and, and rising up and being what they need to be. So you have to get a vision of the reconstruction. And so he started out. Nehemiah started. He went to the king. Good place for you to start out. And this is to go to the king. Amen. Go to the king and ask King Jesus what he wants you to do. Ask which direction he wants you to go and, and, and ask, ask him for his help and his strength. And so he took off and he began the journey. And when he got there, truly it was a devastated mess, worse than anything that he could ever think of. But he sent word out to a lot of Jewish people. And they just begin to come from all over. And uh, one family came and they started on this gate and they, they finished that gate. And, and another one came to another gate and they started on that. And to make a long story short, there was different people came all from all over. Uh, see, the Jews had been dispersed. They'd been sent away from there. But I guess when they saw that there was somebody willing to try, they said, you know what? If Nehemiah can try, I'm willing to try with him. And together, maybe we can do something. So they began to try. They began to build the, the, the gates back and, and start on the walls. And, and, uh, but any time you're headed in the right direction, that devil doesn't like it. And he's going to do his very best to try to stop you from accomplishing what, you, what, God, what God wants you to do. And so he got, they, he got opposition from, from the enemy. And there was uh, Sambalot and Tobiah. And these were, these were uh, 
from other nations and, and they came against you. They didn't want to see Jerusalem being rebuilt. They rejoiced that Jerusalem had been torn down. So they didn't want to see it rebuilt. And they, they thought, what in the world are these crazy Jews doing trying to rebuild this mess, this city? And so they came and they began to talk to Nehemiah and began to tell him, you know, that you, you can't do this, Nehemiah. It's, a, it's a ridiculous for you to even try. And but Nehemiah just blocked them out. Sometimes you have to block the enemy out. When you have made up your mind that you're going to start to improve uh, in your life, start to get closer to God, start to conquer that thing that you've been needing to conquer, and you make up your mind that you're going to conquer it, and the devil's going to come at you and he's going to tell you, you know, you know you can't do that. Block him out of your mind. Call on the name of the Lord. Begin to believe in Jesus that you can do these things. Like Paul said, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. So the, the enemy came at him and tried to persuade him not to even start. Get this out of your mind. It's ridiculous for you to think that you could do such a thing. And so the enemy came against him. And then later his friends came against him. Nehemiah, uh, yeah, we're here to help you, but I'm not really sure about this thing, man. This is, this is a pretty big job. It's bigger than, than what... Uh, uh, what we probably can do, and but you need to get a made up mind. You know that you're going you're going to do it. You're just flat going to do it. I remember Jeremy telling a story years ago when he was a little younger. And I, I don't know if he still does today or not. We had a pretty good sized crew in drywall at that time, and and they'd walk into a job, and and somebody might say, "Well, this is a big job. It's going to be a two or three day house." And Jeremy said, "No, this is a one day house." And uh, they said, "Ain't no way we can get this house done in one day." Now, if you know my son, he's a he's a pretty good worker. And he makes up his mind he's going to do something, he's going to do it. And so he would go to work, and he'd work just as hard as he could. Of course, they'd have to work hard to keep up with him. And, and by the end of the day, they walked out of there, and the house had been sheetrock. They'd done it. That's the kind of attitude we need to have. When the devil tells us we can't, God says we can. So his enemy tried to stop him, and his friends tried to discourage him. Uh, because there's always going to be opposition uh, when, uh, when you try to do something good for God. Uh, but along with the opposition, he had support. First of all, he got the permission from the king. And when you know that you've got permission from the king, King Jesus, to do something, whether it's just live your life, whether it's start a ministry, whether it's to help somebody, whatever it might be, when you know that you've got that support from the king, there's nobody can, that can stop you. Uh, the Bible says that if God be for us, who can be against us? With God, all things are possible. God is able in those difficult situations to turn this world around, and that's the side you and I have to get on. We have to get on the side to believe that it can, uh, and make up our mind that we're going to follow through. We're not going to stop. We're not going to start halfway and get to the middle middle part of the job and say, you know what, hey, we can't make this. We've got to keep on keeping on. So we, we, we need to get that support from the king and, and uh, get the commission, permission, commission. Jesus uh, said in Matthew 28, Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Well, he said, uh, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I'll be with you uh, even to the end of the world. Now, that's a pretty good uh, somebody to link up with. Jesus said, If you'll go make disciples, I'll be with you. And that's what Jesus is telling us in our ministries when we, we got his support. He's standing behind us. He, uh, what's the word we like to say today? He's got our back. He's got our back. He's there with us. He's there for us. He's there beside us. He's there in front of us. He's there behind us. He's there on both sides. He is every place we are, and he's got it all taken care of. He's got it in his hand. And we need to come to that idea, you know, that just, man, uh, we, we've, got to, we've got the commission, the great commission from Christ to go ahead. The supplies, the Nehemiah had to get supplies to build those gates. Whatever supplies we need, God's going to provide for us. Amen. If, if God commissions you to do something, he's also going to give you the provision to do it. Well, I don't have any money to start a ministry. I don't have this. I don't have that. There's been multitudes of ministries started out on nothing more than a vision, nothing more than a prayer. And when they begin to pray, all of a sudden, God would begin to bring things into their life, maybe other people, maybe maybe businesses that would just open up their doors and, and help them uh, with, with what they needed. And uh, we, we've got a food pantry here in this town that's just a pretty good food pantry. When uh, we started this food pantry, we started five years ago, in our church, or uh, yeah, about five years. It ran for five years in our church. When we first started, 
our gym wasn't even really completed. We didn't have heat in it. Uh, it was in the middle of, it was November when we started. It was cold. And man, it just didn't, you know, it, it, we, we made it. I mean, we probably fed two or 300 families that first first time that we met and was able to distribute food. Well, we, we, we just kept at it. We, we made things a little bit better. And, and God opened doors and windows of opportunity to where things began to to come our way and provision and blessing. And I was on the board, and some people on the board said, we want to we want to buy our own building. And I'm thinking, we can't buy our own building. We don't even have any income. And uh, But there's a guy come on the board, and he, he had dealt with fundraising. And he said, I think we can raise some money. And he, he went to some big organizations in Springfield. He was from Springfield. And he got these these uh, multi-million dollar corporations to write a check for like $200,000 or $50,000, whatever it might be, and it would give them a tax write-off. And it wasn't any time at all, less than six months, he had raised $500,000. And we bought the old building that used to be the Gerb store. And today, it's up and running. It's a great thing. Why? Because somebody had vision. Somebody had an idea. They, they got the commission to do it. They got the supplies to do it. And, and they went for it. And that's the way it is in your life. It's the way it is in the church. It's the way it is in the ministry. But it's the way it is with you individually that when everything comes against you, God will make a way. God will make a way regardless of what is in, in front of you. And uh, Nehemiah kept at it because he there was something that burned in his heart. And when you get the vision of God burning in your spirit and in your soul, nothing is going to shut you down. Nothing is going to stop you. It doesn't matter how many times you get the door slammed in your face. Maybe the next door is the one that's going to open. No many times you've been told no, maybe the next one's the one that's going to say yes. God is going to bring you to the point. If he called you to do it, God's going to take you through it. Nehemiah had an overcoming attitude, and that's what we got to have in this world to have the victory. When the enemy said he couldn't do it, you know what he did? He went to work. The enemy's over there standing over there saying, you can't do it. Nehemiah just grabbed a brick and grabbed some mortar and started laying a wall. And uh, uh, they gathered forces to, to discourage him. And, and uh, But every time more people would stand up and say, Nehemiah, you can't do it. Nehemiah, you're a crazy old man. What do you think you're doing? He kept right on working even when people were telling him he can't. You know why? Because he knew that God had put it in his heart. And it came down to the place to where the other nations even declared war on them. They, several nations were going to come together, and they were going to fight against uh, Nehemiah to, to stop this. I mean, they hated Jerusalem that bad. They did not want that wall to be rebuilt. They wanted it to lay in shambles. But God said, we're going to raise it up. We're going to raise it up out of the heap, and Jerusalem will be a city again. And he used Nehemiah to start that. And so they got the armies of these other nations together, and they came against them. Well, God gave Nehemiah... Uh, the the answer to all of that. Uh, he, he Nehemiah had a pretty good construction crew here, but this time, because like I said, a lot of different people came from all over, came back to Jerusalem, start to work. You see, when you start, there's something right there. When you start something that God wants you to start, God's going to bring those to help you, and that's what you need to do. And so Nehemiah said, "Well, we're going to keep on working, but I guess we probably better use some wisdom." So he, he half the crew would stand on the wall with their weapons warding off any enemy that might try to come while the other half uh, continued to work. And so they continue to do this. They, they lay the work. And uh, uh, while everything looked like they weren't going to be able to do it, they even told lies about Nehemiah. They, they told him, you know, you know every, anybody ever tell a lie about you? That hurts. That hurts to the core. Because uh, a lot of times you can't defend that lie. You just have to stick with the truth, keep on doing what you know is right, and eventually in the end it'll come out. So they did everything they possibly could to stop Nehemiah. And as they were telling him he can't, Nehemiah kept right on keeping on. He was following through. He started something. Where did it start? It started with the, when, uh, when he heard about a problem. It's, it, I want to say that again. I want you to understand. It. it started when he heard about a problem. And you may have a problem. Think about your own problem. Think about how I'm going to do something about my problem. I'm not just going to sit and let this problem take uh, me down. Nehemiah heard about it. He got, heard about the problem. He began to get permission, and he went through with it, and he finished the wall while everybody was standing out there saying, Nehemiah, you can't do it. Nehemiah laid that blast brick in the wall, hung the gates on the hinges, stood up and said, it is done. It is finished. It took him 52 days to reconstruct, repair the wall around Jerusalem. 
a miracle in itself. Why? Because somebody said, you know what? I'm going to start something, and I'm going to follow through. I'm going to start something, and I'm not going to give up. And that's the attitude people have to have. People that are successful uh, have the attitude they're not going to give up. I couldn't tell you the number of stories, and my goodness, people that are millionaires and billionaires that fell flat on their face more times than once, went bankrupt a few times, till finally they kept on keeping on, they followed through, and their, their efforts were blessed. And in your Christian life, there may be times you fall down. But don't you ever give up. Don't you ever give up. In closing tonight, I, I just want that to get it into your spirit. Don't you ever give up. It says in Proverbs that the righteous man falls down seven times, but he gets back up. And the wicked, when they fall down, they stay down. So aren't you glad tonight that you're a, a Christian? So you fall down, but God, the devil's not going to keep you down. You're going to get up. You're going to prevail. Before I close tonight, I don't want you to think about something. I don't know who I'm speaking to, but there's people out there that are probably facing discouragement. You're facing situations that you don't know what you're going to do about it. But first of all, look at the problem. Look at the king. Talk to the king about it. And let God begin to lead you in a pathway that will bring that thing to um, a solution. You'll gain victory over it. You'll win the battle one way or another. And I, let me, I just want to say one more thing. Just because a door is shut doesn't always mean that that's uh, the worst thing because maybe that door has to be shut for a better one to open up. I uh, was talking to somebody today and they need an apartment. And they uh, went to this one apartment complex and there wasn't, really wasn't any reason why they wouldn't rent. They had a couple which is unique today, and they, they wouldn't rent it to them. And there wasn't any legal reason why they wouldn't rent it to them, but the door was shut. And I had run across something else today before. I said, I'm going to check on a certain apartment complex I know of. And so I went this afternoon, went into that building, and then I told them who I was and what I was looking for, or so somebody else. And she, the person said, well, we, we don't have any here, but we've got two uh, just a few miles from here that are open, and we would love to work with these people. And it's a much, much bigger and better place than the one where the door was shut. So you pray with me on that. I don't know if it's going to be a go yet or not. Uh, there may be another door shut. But I want to pray that that door can, continues to stay open. And these people who, who need it, they're, they're both disabled, living on very limited income. And they need a place to live. They need a place to live. They love God. And so I want you to pray with me as we pray right now that God will open that door for them. Father, we just ask God in Jesus' name that you will open this door, God, and you will make a way that this couple will have a place to live, a place they can call their own, God, a place that's nice, decent, and comfortable, Lord, and it will be a blessing to them, and they can give you the praise for it. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Leaving you with that tonight, I want you to follow through with whatever, you, whatever God has put in your heart. Don't give up. Keep on keeping on. God bless. See you this weekend. Amen.